We're a nonprofit organization dedicated to eradicating human slavery, human trafficking, child exploitation, and child sexual abuse material through disrupting networks and applying data technology and advanced analytics and intelligence. Welcome to everyone. Welcome to our, our panel today. Our discussion is on anti-human trafficking and counter child exploitation operational engagement. My name is Bill Wolf. I'm former acting director at the Office for Victims of Crime, the U.S. Department of Justice. And I'm really privileged to be joined by such an incredible panel here today. Uh, we have a mix of experts that have uh, operational experience at the local, state, federal level, uh, even some international experience, as well as uh, with with doing some uh, non-governmental operations as well. And so uh, this is really going to be uh, quite an informative panel to really discuss um, how these different organizations can work together. Throughout my career, something that's been incredibly important to me is collaboration. How do we work through uh, this multi-agency approach to make sure that everyone is, is really working together? And so uh, without further ado, I wanna just really jump into this topic because it's something that's so important to, anti -tra to the Anti-Trafficking Intelligence Initiative because ATII really does support, lead, and participates in various different task forces and working groups all across the US and globally as well. And so we're going to really dive into how does that work and what are best practices uh, around these, these different issues. And I want to start with uh, Doug Gilmer, uh, who is uh, President and CEO of Resolve Strategies, but formerly with the U.S. Department of Homeland Security, serving uh, lastly at the, uh, the Counter Human Trafficking Center. So, Doug, thank you so much for, for joining us today. And you really had that, that sort of global and national perspective uh, from both your time as, as a field agent, running an office, uh, working in human trafficking, but then obviously at the center. So I wonder if you could tell us a little bit about what the center does for those that aren't too familiar uh, with its work and its coordination. And then what were the trends that you were seeing as far as uh, our efforts to engage multidisciplinary operations. Yeah, so the, the DHS Center for Countering Human Trafficking was actually established by law, uh, by an act of Congress in 2020. Uh, the funding legislation was somewhat delayed because of COVID, but ultimately signed a couple of years later. And really what it does is it creates a single entity within the U.S. government and within the Department of Homeland Security solely focused on the issue of human trafficking, um, whether it's uh, sex trafficking, labor trafficking, uh, forced labor in the supply chain, um, all different aspects of, of human trafficking. Uh, and the center um, currently employs um, around 100 or just over 100 uh, full-time employees. Some of those are special agents. Uh, some of those are intel analysts. Some of those are public engagement specialists. And what the center does is it brings all of those different resources together and all of the different resources across the Department of Homeland Security uh, to bear on this particular, particular issue. So from operations and investigations, where the center supports uh, HSI investigations in the field across the country and really globally around the world um, to intelligence support uh, to our folks and, and not just our folks, but even our state and local partners. Uh, so we don't limit it to just ourselves. Um, providing training um, across the across the country and really, again, around the world um, and resources for victim protection. Um, so, um, providing not only resources to, uh, to victims and survivors of human trafficking, but also negotiating kind of those trickier issues when it comes to continued presence and, and T visas and, and that kind of thing, which are now 
you know, process through the, through the center in terms of, in terms of trends, um, you know, the, the whole goal of creating the center was to be able to work in a multidisciplinary format. Um, and I know that's a big thing for you. Um, that's, that's my big, that's my big passion is creating, you know, effective collaborations, um, across multiple stakeholders and, um, and that's another part of the job of the CCHT is to build those relationships, not just across government, but with it, but with all, also, um, you know, our, our nonprofit NGO partners, recognizing that we simply cannot, cannot do this alone. Um, and then that it really even extends beyond that to industry. Um, I mean, we have industry partners who are, you know, particularly well positioned, um, with you know vital information and resources and uh, to help with this issue whether it's the financial industry the um the import industry when we start talking about forced labor in the supply chain supply chain specialists um there's there's really no limit to the amount of collaboration because this issue touches so many different so many different segments of of society yeah. And I think that's that's so important to, to be thinking about, right, is that it does, you know, we think about the, the scope of human trafficking, right? And it certainly is something that is impacting or has the potential to impact every community. But then thinking about all the different sectors, right, that are now intersecting with it. Of course, law enforcement, uh, our victim services groups are kind of the most obvious, but we think about youth that are being trafficked, right? Uh, so we talk about schools and social workers and, uh, you know, and then we talk about the private sector, hospitality and all these other different groups. And so it really does become very truly a multidisciplinary approach, right? To, to being right. effective. And healthcare. Uh, healthcare is huge. Absolutely. Yeah. Healthcare I mean, is, is a huge piece of that for sure. Um, and so kind of shifting to, to Kevin, you have a, a unique perspective. You started your career as a prosecutor. Uh, you went on to found uh, the National Child Protection Task Force. You know, we're just talking about minors that are involved in this. It's a huge problem. Um, now you just recently joined the Oklahoma State Attorney General's Office uh, and overseeing that statewide response. Right. And so can you talk a little bit about what does that look like? How do you coordinate those state level efforts and then collaborate with our federal partners like Doug and, and those at the center. Yes. So, you know, my background goes back. I went through basic training in the army in 1988. And so I've worked in one uniform or another since then did a little over 20 years in law enforcement, uh, military, state, local, and federal, uh, before I was a prosecutor. So I've got, got the investigative background and then uh, prosecutor for about 12 or 13 years. So with, you know, last year, I, I think I was in about 12 countries, which is a little, little crazy. But, you know, when I look back at it, you know, you're, you're really bouncing around from one place to another, doing talks, helping with the, helping law enforcement in these countries with, with operations, uh, leading into prosecution and, and things like that. But, you know, everybody's got so much to do. When you look back, it's almost like, you know, I just showed up, there's a blip, and then there's there's no movement anymore so in oklahoma when this this came up this opportunity I, I thought it was really interesting they passed house bill 4210 which mandates that the attorney general will create a human trafficking response unit and there are five, i think six things that it that it outlines and what you know doug did a, an amazing presentation at my conference a few months ago on collaboration, the, the power of, of all of this. And House Bill 4210 calls for collaboration between nonprofits, these NGOs, and law enforcement and the government. Calls for in, enhanced collaboration. And you know, what does that look like and how do we do it? I'm also supposed to help with the grants obtaining money for, for service providers, which uh, that'll be interesting. We're looking at, at policy. I've got once I get my team going, we're, we're going to review policies for all of the state agencies, provide training, uh, public service announcements. You know, so there, there's a lot of education. There's a lot of uh, collaborative work. But, you know, we've everybody's really busy. Everybody's got a lot to do. And human trafficking, 
you know, law enforcement, military work, we're kind of a checklist oriented group and human trafficking. There's really no, no way to do that because it doesn't ever look the same. Familial trafficking, gang trafficking, whatever it may be, you know, labor trafficking, like Doug said, what does that look like? Looks like people going to work. So it's just a super difficult field to look at. And if we, if we're not all working together, you know, we're, we're really not going to get anywhere. It's just going to be siloed and we're going to continue to just spin our wheel. So kind of what I've got in mind for Oklahoma is to, to bring on some agents. I think this is going to be the core of it. And to, and I, I know uh, Joe had actually gotten Mississippi and I think Louisiana, some other groups spun up years ago and they're, they're really doing a tremendous job and I really like what they're doing. So I'm wanting to, to do something similar in bringing these agents on, having them cert they're certified law enforcement instructors. We get them up to SME standards on whatever that looks like, human trafficking, you know, get them exposed to how, how's Mississippi, how are they doing operations? Uh, you know, David Weiss in New York City, his team, how are they doing it? We look at Texas, we look at, at all these different places and just start getting that exposure and bringing it back so we can kind of start, start working here. You know, here we've got uh, HSI heavily involved uh, in, in Tulsa, where I'm at. That's where they're seated. So federal, state, local. And, and Oklahoma is a little different. We've also got tribal lands, which creates its own interesting spin. And I'm, I'm constantly learning, you know, crimes committed on tribal land or what if you have a tribal member as a suspect, a tribal member as a victim. So there, there's a lot of nuances there. So, you know, we, we, we really have to look at, at where we're at. What does trafficking look like there? You know, what are the populations you're serving? And then, you know, the, back to, the idea is to get the agents going around the state, creating a, a database of certified human trafficking investigators that we can then support, encourage to do operations where we'll come in and do full support, whatever they need, mentoring, guiding until they get the hang of it, and then encourage that, that statewide. And I think that's, that's the direction, at least what I've got in my head right now uh, with that. And, you know, having, having uh, well, Austin was in my office about a week, week or so ago, and, you know, I've got, got Joe and got Doug, got, got a lot of people that I'm leaning on heavily saying, Hey, what do you think of this plan? And I'm, I'm bouncing it off a lot of people. So it's, it's, uh, it's, it's coming together really well. But one of the things is I'm not doing this alone. I'm, mm -hmm. I'm leaning heavily on, uh, you know, on the people on this call that you know, we're all talking right now, leaning heavily on this group as well as others. Well, and, and it is, it's a difficult task, right? And it's interesting, you know, so many people is the general public, if you will, kind of thinks, well, you know, of course, where we must have these response plans and, and everyone's working together. But even if you look at the United States, the United States didn't get its national action plan to combat human trafficking until just 20, 24 years ago, right? Uh, and so, you know, it's, it's a slow moving process. And back in the day, uh, back when uh, Detective Scaramucci was starting to work cases and, you know, there, there wasn't a playbook, right? There wasn't that checklist, right, that, that you were talking about, Kevin. I know uh, certainly we can all relate to that and say, you know, if, if you tell me how to do it step by step, we can get it done. But now you're starting to throw this new thing of human trafficking and how to investigate, right? And, and it was really a new area for us, uh, even at the local level. So, Joe, I wonder, you know, you've, you've seen that, right? You've worked at that local level. Uh, you were really leading the way in developing, you know, some innovative investigative strategies and, um, and, and really we're spearheading efforts to work with nonprofit organizations or, even, you know, non-governmental organizations. Could you talk a little bit about that process, right? How did you learn to start to collaborate with these groups? Because, you know, law enforcement, sometimes we like to work in our lane, right? We're like, you know, just just leave us alone. Let us do our job and you do your thing. Right. But yeah. but you were one of the, the the guys out there saying, wait a minute, we got to break down those walls. We got to be able to work together. Can you, can you talk about that from a local investigator standpoint? Yeah, I mean, for me, um, you know, like you said, I mean, we're kind of building the plane as we flew back then. And, you know, we had days of old, we knew the old vice tactics, we knew the investigative process for arresting a whole bunch of women and begging them to talk to us. And, and it just wasn't working, right? So 
Um, for me, I'll admit I was I was one of the first ones to to do the hey I'm the police you go away type thing, and uh, kept having an, a non governmental organization reaching out to us wanting to partner. Um, they knew that we were doing sting operations and and were wanting to be there for victim services. Um, and and for me, thank God this happened very early for me. Um, and this I'll be very clear: this is the only time this has ever happened. But I did have a victim come running at me. And this time she wasn't throwing fists. She was like open arms yelling, um, oh, my God, I'm glad you're here. I've been forced to do this. Mm -hmm. And I was like, hi, what do I do here? I don't know what to do because you're supposed to be calling me names and like throwing swings at me. Um, and, and I had to eat a little bit of crow there and call who we had dubbed the church ladies and tell them, hey, like. I've got this victim and, and you said that you're going to help me if I find one. Well, here we are. Um, and thank God uh, that organization unbound, um, they met us at the office within like 15 minutes and they, they ended up taking that victim, getting her back where she wanted to be at home, uh, providing the resources and doing all of that. And it was really, it was beautiful how it flowed, right? You know, it let me do the law enforcement job and do the investigation and not have to focus my attention on how do I even get this victim home, right? And and we worry about doing all of those roles a lot, I think, in, in, in law enforcement. And it was just kind of one of those like pushing away and going, that is not my lane. And after that, you know, I swore to myself, well, look what just happened. The victims are going to come running and screaming, begging for help. Um, it's never happened again. But the next operation we did, I wanted to have the NGOs on site, right? Because the thought process was that's what was going to happen. And what I found over time is, you know, it's a it's a marathon. It's not a sprint. You guys know that. You know, you're going to come in contact with the same victim multiple times before they actually want help for the, the most part. And having those NGOs there to do that um, is super helpful. Looking at the the OG, you know, investigative strategies before I did counter trafficking work, I, I investigated death investigations. So, you know, even looking at that and pausing and saying what we're doing is not working. Um, I'm letting these traffickers bond these girls out of jail and walk off and I never see them again. They're beating me. Um, and I wish this was my idea, but my part partner at the time, he just said, Hey man, we've, we've literally never worked a murder where the victim told us who killed them. Um, let's just work it that way. And we did ever since. Um, and it's, it's proven to be extremely effective. Um, it, one thing kind of to echo, you know, what Kevin and Doug have both said, I, I agree that trafficking in different areas and arenas is going to be different. But one thing I found traveling the country and the world, the investigative methodology generally doesn't change. It tends to be the same. It's just the lens that we're looking at that particular kind of trafficking or the nuance that's happening in that region, whether it be cultural or, or you know, whatever. Um, so it really makes it easy to, to replicate. And and now you're with Skull Games. Could you inter introduce us to Skull Games? What's yes. the work you're doing now, and and how they interact with law enforcement? Yeah, so they started suckering me in uh, a few years ago to to come along and do some things. Uh, my background is ten years in in counter sex trafficking work and and labor trafficking. Um, I was a TFO with HSI for about a decade almost, um, and in watching what we do is provide intelligence support to law enforcement um we don't provide it to non-governmental organizations we're not going out trying to breach doors and do all of the hoopla stuff we are only there to support them um in an investigative capacity so with our partner organizations if they want to do live sting operations if they want uh intel pre-operation uh, we will provide that to them and and hopefully get them uh, traffickers and victims alike identified before they even have to send a text message to try to set up the the dates or the undercovers. So and and that's a, a great example, right, of where non governmental organizations can really support the efforts that are happening as far as interdiction, dismantling, 
Uh, and that's, you know, a lot of what ATII really seeks to do is to be able to support, provide that information, provide that data, that intel uh, to really be able to be effective in dismantling these organizations, helping survivors exit exploitation, uh, really, really critical. And, you know, Austin, uh, Kevin mentioned earlier the the Native American populations. Um, I know you, you've traveled the world, you've worked with uh, a lot of different groups and a lot of different capacities, awesome. um, and, and your path has led to the Traverse Project, uh, which is really using a lot of that data, being very data-driven uh, to help interdict and identify what's happening, support those, those awesome. other efforts. But I know the project that you have launching this year in 2024 um, is specifically focused on supporting tribal law enforcement agencies and starting to address the issue with missing and murdered Indigenous women. I wonder if you could talk a little bit about what are the problems that you're seeing in these, these tribal lands, on these reservations? What are the differences or the nuances to tribal law enforcement that may differ from that federal, state, or even local level in the rest of the United States, and what is Traverse Project doing to support that? Um, so it, I think the, it, I can sum this all up in just one kind of uh, quick story. If your child, if any anybody on this this uh, call right now, if your child went missing, there'd be helicopters and dogs and police that would go looking for that child. We call it a critical missing in, in law enforcement. Um, on tribal lands, that doesn't happen. So you have juveniles and women and men you know for various reasons go missing every day murdered end up murdered there's um uh kind of a somewhat uh national case in the in the tribal community now where uh, a famous actor his nephew was was murdered in kansas and um it falls within this mmiw problem right um so we're seeing a lot of uh, addiction, you know, as we see it with any trafficking, we're seeing a lot of addiction, um, but mainly the the tribal law enforcement don't have the resources to investigate these types of crimes. And then you have this very odd jurisdictional issues that come into play, um, you know, where Kevin is right now, there's uh, two or three tribal reservations that kind of intersect at Tulsa in the Tulsa area. Um, it is a crime, a federal crime? Is it a tribal issue? Is it a state issue? It's it, like every time that a crime occurs, they have to kind of go through this litany of, okay, who's, whose problem is this, right? Um, and then, you know, you have, uh, for a great example, in 2016, you had 5,712 cases of MMIW, right? Which is now being referred to as MMIP, M Murdered Missing Indigenous Persons. Um, and in the same year, only 116 cases were logged into the FBI system that were investigated. So if a homicide happens on tribal land, <clears throat> there there are some, depending state to state, but for the most part, uh, if, a, if a homicide happens on tribal land, it gets tossed up to the FBI. The FBI has approximately 100 agents that are assigned to uh, what's referred to as Indian country. That means all the reservations in the country. Um, and we see only 116 cases were investigated, right? Um, so it, there's a massive problem. You know, digital forensics, there's a big problem. Um, it gets pushed. If they collect a, a phone or a device that needs to be exploited, most of the time it gets pushed over to the state. State's got backlogs. Um, you know, it gets even it gets even crazier than that. If there is a, a homicide that happens on a tribal land and the suspect could potentially be a non-native person, tribal police can't investigate that. So it, it, it just it's there's a lot of jurisdictional issues that come into this on top of their uh, lack of resources or lack of funding uh, to investigate these crimes. For example, Pine Ridge, uh, which is in southern South Dakota had to sue the federal government last year twice and won twice uh, for violation of treaty uh, because they weren't supporting or they weren't funding their their law enforcement responsibilities. Um, so the, a lot of issues specifically to what we're doing is we're building a multifaceted approach at this MMIWP issue, um, bringing in uh, universities to do awareness programs. Uh, we have some great partners, TransUnion's one of our partners, 
um, to do enhanced law enforcement solutions, which will give those cops some better uh, tools, analytical tools and, and data to, to kind of drive those, those operations that they need to do to recover um, you know, missing people or to investigate homicides. Uh, and then on the back end, we have great partners like Randstead that's coming in uh, and War Party Ranch that are coming in. Uh, and they are the aftercare programs that we have kind of assigned for survivors. So Randstead, for example, has a 35-week program that, um, that young women or uh, men, whomever comes out of these, any survivors can go into these programs and, and kind of get set up for success. That's awesome. And it does, you know, I mean, being able to come alongside and support them, because you're absolutely right. We've seen that in so many different ways. Um, not only, you know, when we talk about uh, the, the reservations, uh, they're very rural, they're sparse, right? But they just don't have the technology um, and, and they don't have the funding either to be able to support that technology. And so I just think it's extremely commendable. Um, that Traverse is leveraging its resources to come alongside and support those efforts. Um, we hope the federal government follows suit, right, uh, to, to be able to help support that work that you're doing. But again, standing in the gap, uh, and, and that's so, so incredibly commendable. You know, we talk about, one, yeah. I think one also. important point is that this is the only crime set that nonprofits play a role, right? We don't We don't play a role with drugs or guns or anything else. Um, and there's a variety of reasons why that is. But when I left my previous organization, it, we had seen this trend of kind of special operations guys starting up organizations that just wanted to kick open doors and, you know, just kind of do what they're really good at. And what we can all I can guarantee, I, I'll, I'll speak for everybody on this on this call. We can't, that's not the way to, to solve this problem, right? We need data-driven solutions. We need collaborations. Those are the two things that we haven't seen, but people like the one, like my colleagues here on the call, we're all pushing in that direction. Skull Games, here are two special, or, you know, one, Jeff, uh, who, who started this organization, Skull Games, who comes from a very, very top-tier uh, special operations uh, job and said, that's not what this needs. This needs data-driven methods. This needs data intelligence and created this. I mean, Skull Games is on fire. I mean, they're fantastic. Those guys are crushing it. So good job, Joe. Hey, and they, they picked a great logo for it too, right? Because yes. it's, it's yep. Skull on fire. Yep. Yeah. Skull so, yeah. We also have 200 volunteers helping us to be very yeah. clear. And we are the only nonprofit I'm aware of that the, the symbol is a burning skull. So, I mean... <laughs> Hey, you know, if the shoe fits, right? Uh, but look, no, and, and I think, Austin, that's so that's so incredibly important to recognize. This is probably one of the only problem sets out there, right, where we are truly needing to be multidisciplinary. And I think it's important to reemphasize that because there is this effort, right, uh, sort of behind the scenes to, to divest that and basically say, well, you know what, this is just a social issue. Let's let uh, social workers handle this problem and, you know, let's address sort of root causes um, and ignore law enforcement and prosecuting the offenders. And I think that's a huge mistake, right? Uh, we've got to make sure that we recognize at the heart of it, this is still a crime. And there are offenders who are doing bad things to people that are not deserving of those, right? And so we have to make sure that we don't lose sight of that. But then at the same time, we have to make sure law enforcement is being supported by those social services because we know the survivors that exit exploitation have incredible needs, right? Uh, and so we need to make sure that they're supported throughout that criminal justice process so that law enforcement can do its job of holding offenders accountable. Now, the federal government has uh, come up with a task force model called the Enhanced Collaborative Model. Um, where it really does try to fund these multidisciplinary uh, task forces. And Doug, you, you know, you're not just a federal agent, you're not just a pretty face, uh, but you're also a researcher as well. And uh, you did a lot of uh, research on this issue of enhanced collaborative model task forces, some of the challenges behind it, but some of the successes and a path forward as well. I wonder if you could talk about some of that research that you've done, some of the findings as we look to really enhance our efforts at being more collaborative. Sure, and and I wanna back up just one moment to a comment that you made um, 
about this, you know, not just being a social issue. Um, it's also not just a morality issue. Um, and that we tried that in the U S um, several decades ago and it didn't, it didn't work. Um, you know, treating this as a morality issue, um, uh, because as society changes, so do cultural norms and, and acceptable behavior and, and, and that kind of thing. So, um, but as far as the enhanced collaborative model goes, or, um, you know, I, it, it's another word for MDTs, right? Multidisciplinary teams. I often joke that because DOJ didn't invent the term MDT, they had to come up with their own term. Um, so that's, um, that's why they call it ECMs. Um, but this model has really, it's, it's been around, um, since the early 1900s, uh, 1902 actually. And it was, it was the Mayo brothers, um, who started the Mayo clinic that in, that invented this multidisciplinary team concept, you know, within healthcare and then it spread to engineering. And then in the eighties to, um, to child abuse and neglect and, you know, kind of to where we are today using it, uh, in this particular field. So, um, I can tell you that from, you know, the, the research that I did, um, everybody that's using this model say it's enormously effective. Um, the reason they're using it is because traditional methods didn't work. Um, but you know, it, it takes time because anytime that you, you bring a, a, a diverse team of people together, um, it takes time to build trust, right? And, and trust is the foundation for any, any effective team. And the best, the best data that's out there, the best researchers that are out there tell us that it takes two to five years uh, for a team to develop a sufficient level of trust before they're able to work together. So it's a process. It doesn't, it, it's not something that's going to happen overnight. Um, you know, accountability is part of that. Um, we have to hold each other accountable because if we're truly working in a collaborative, multidisciplinary way, the results of that team should not be tied to just one person or just one organization. Um, the results should be collective, right? So if, if you're the NGO, if you're the service provider, your goals should be my goals in law enforcement my goal should be your goals. We should be working, we should be working collectively together toward those end results and holding each other accountable. And, and once we can get to the point where we agree on what the mission is and we've developed trust and we can practice accountability, then we get to the point of what I call shared purpose, right? And, and shared purpose is kind of the secret sauce uh, for everybody, you know, being able to work together effectively. Uh, there are some there are some obvious challenges in any in any team dynamic. There's there's power dynamics between law enforcement, uh, victim service providers. There are issues just with the grant process. I mean the the grant process, all of that data, all of that paperwork is just so daunting. And then you know a lot of groups get grants, whether they're they're ECM grants or other you know other grants, and sometimes the they're so restrictive that they keep the, you know, these organizations or task forces or MDTs, coalitions, whatever, from really being able to do what they need to do locally where they're at in order to be effective. Um, you have a lot of organizations or agencies that'll join an effort because they get a grant and now suddenly there's a cash cow. And everybody wants to jump on board because now there's a pot of money. But once that three-year grant cycle is over and, and maybe one or, you know, two one-year extensions, whatever, once that money's gone, a lot of the partners are gone. Um, a, lot of a lot of organizations that I talked to said that they were actually more effective once, once they got out of that grant because the financial incentive was gone. And now motivations truly became pure uh, within, you know, from the uh, from the participants. 
but I think, you know, from an outcome standpoint, the things that I thought were, were most telling, um, were the fact that, you know, everybody agreed, not only, you know, is there better and more efficient delivery of victim services, not only are there, there more and more effective prosecutions, but victim stability, victim recovery, uh, was the, was the overarching number one outcome, um, in all of this. And it was funny because in the data, law enforcement overwhelmingly, overwhelmingly said, yeah, victim stability, that's the number one outcome. It wasn't prosecutions. It wasn't arrests. The victim service providers, while still saying victim stability was number one, they had a much higher response rate indicating prosecutions and arrests. But I think that also kind of goes back to that idea of, of accountability um, and kind of that, that collective mission where your goals become my goals and my goals become your goals, right? If, if victim services, if, if they're thinking prosecutions uh, is important, then they're going to do whatever they have to do to help aid us in making sure that that trafficker goes to jail just as much as we're going to do to help ensure that that victim gets the services that they need for recovery. Yeah, and and I think you hit on some some really good points there. And I want to, Joe, I want to jump to you for a second uh, and and talk about you know I'm just sort of paraphrasing what Doug was saying, and that is there sometimes things get lost in translation, right? You know, and I think it's it's fascinating that so often law enforcement is sort of judged, if you will, um, or there's this presumption that their only focus is prosecution. But in the study, it was more on victim stabilization, knowing that that leads to successful prosecutions, right? And then alternatively, you know, everyone sort of assumes that service providers are more focused on stabilization as a priority, but they want the offenders held accountable because that leads to stabilization, right? Because then survivors are not terribly, you know, they're not always concerned and living in fear that their trafficker is going to find them. Can you talk a little bit about how do we translate, right? How do we um, all sit at the table and communicate that message? I know you've done it really well with a lot of great organizations. Um, what's the what's the secret sauce in being able to communicate that message back and forth? Yeah, I think it's openness, right? And just being honest with each other. Um, to echo a lot of what Doug said, you know, I've we were an ECM task force back 2015, I believe. Um, I, I work with them in, in some of my, my consulting roles now. And one thing I've noticed is the, the lack of communication, even for good things, right? Um, I was just meeting with a task force and they asked a very, very, the law enforcement asked a very, very basic question about what the service provider would do in a certain scenario. And my response to that is, why are we just asking this? This, this should be, this is a very basic question. You're all clearly going for the same goal, victim restoration, accountability for the trafficker. What is my role and what is my lane in doing that? And I think what, what Doug has discussed is really interesting because in, in kind of what you just said, you know, a healthy victim is a good victim when it comes to prosecution, right? So having them stabilized because they have the ability to actually go to services when their trafficker is arrested and be able to breathe a sigh of relief in order to do it is going to be huge, right? And when you look at, well, I only we only want to do this from, from a ser service provision uh, perspective. If you go watch what's occurring, the traffickers are literally dropping their victims off to receive services and picking them up. So that's never going to work, right? We can never arrest our way out of the problem. Um, but I think just having those real clear, hard conversations sometimes is what's going to take these these task forces to 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 bigger steps. Because again, I, I have to be able to say your goal and my goal are the same, but we're coming at it from two different angles. 
let me understand your side of it. Because if I can understand your side, I at least know a, what your goal is and B how you're getting there. And if you know the same with me, that's huge. Um, I'm a huge proponent of the service providers and organizations being with law enforcement every single step of the way, including briefings, including operations, you know, having them there, there's no, there's no top secret sauce that we're hiding in any of this, right? So having them there to be able to work along, partner, get to know and become friends. Hey, let's go have unofficial breakfast this week. Those little things really go a long way because they they humanize each other, right? And, and they help us understand that we may not agree on the way that this is going to be or how we're going to get there, but we're going to collectively do it together. I, I love that. You know, it sometimes we forget it's the simple things, right? Grabbing a cup of coffee, grabbing a beer after hours, just to, to form those human relationships is a way that we can start to build trust because that's what it really boils down to, right? And I think it boils down to trust and resources, right? And Doug talked about, uh, you know, being able to, to get those different resources that are needed at the table. Kevin, you're responsible for creating a statewide response now uh, and having to bring together all those different resources to bear. C could you talk a little bit about what does that look like? You've got law enforcement that can bring its resources, but you've got great organizations like Traverse and Skull Games, right, that can augment law enforcement operations. But then you also have service providers that, you know, some specialize in one thing, whereas maybe a, per, uh, a survivor needs services, other specialized services. So when resources are so limited, can you talk a little bit about how making sure that everyone can pull their resources together and co collaborate can help build a much more robust response mechanism? Well, I'll try. I am uh, still learning. There's a pretty steep learning curve here, and it's you know it's a, a new new territory, new place, new people. So in Oklahoma, the Attorney General's office has a certification process for uh, these uh, not not necessarily shelters, but these uh, victim service providers. We have three in the state. So uh, Divis, which focuses on uh, domestic violence. In Tulsa, there is the, the spring. And in Oklahoma City, Dragonfly, those are the, the ones that are certified. They are it's transparency. Here's where the money goes. You know, the, this is how we do things, site visits, all that. So the, you know, that's, that's my main focus right now, or, or those three. And I got to say, Tulsa PD, I've been very, very impressed with how they operate. Doug's been there to do training. And that that unit, um, and I'm just getting introduced, uh, of course, to Oklahoma City. I'm in Tulsa, so that's, that's where I've spent most of my time getting to know this. But there, as Joe said, have those service providers there every step of the way, and they do. So the spring, which is there in Tulsa, and uh, Tulsa PD, they work together on, on the planning and the execution of these operations. The, they will not execute an operation without those services and those people there and their input along the way. And there, there's been some growing pains uh, from listening mm -hmm. to, the, to Leslie and, and, uh, and Nick talk about all the struggles of how, how this first started off. Her relationship started off a little rocky because, you know, cops don't necessarily know what service providers do in, in the in the earlier days before they, they really got uh, moving along well, but it's learning from each other, and you got to understand that you're you're going to make mistakes. Uh, you may have a service provider get in uh, and and you know talking to a victim and say, "Well, they're not going to take you to jail," and then you know she's got a felony warrant and and other stuffs going on that she didn't know about, and that's that's a key thing. You know, learn what you can and you can't say from the service provider's perspective, and also from from law enforcement. When you have a, a victim, you got service providers right there. You, know, you, you got to go through safety issues and all that, but the victim goes straight in to talk to these service providers. And law enforcement does not interfere unless they're asked to until they finish whatever they're doing and come back and say, "We here's what we need or here's what's going on. So the 
the, the, there's a there's a pretty steep learning curve here, and I I think and you know Joe may and you know you guys may have a little little more insight into this as I I've mainly been involved in the prosecution and the you know, some of the investigation, especially on the the, the technology side, has been where where I really specialize. But in Oklahoma City, there's there's a little different relationship between Oklahoma City PD and Dragon and Dragonfly that's out there. So you've also got personalities with, you know, not only the leadership, but the people who are going to show up out here and do things. And I got to say, one of the things that, that really has struck a chord is, is that, you know, I think Doug mentioned the, the, the trust the relationships. You got to, you got to build this along the way. So if you have, if you're working with some of these organizations that, that want to be part of this and, Law enforcement calls you at two o'clock in the morning to come help a victim and you don't show up, you don't answer the phone, you know, that's, they're going to stop calling you. So you, you got to understand that, you know, and also if law enforcement doesn't adapt and change, change their language in some cases, the service providers, there's got to be that give and take. And there's been a lot of learning I've, I've seen going on here with the, the interaction between uh, the PD and service providers and, and that being in, engaged in that operation from the planning, all the briefings. And like Joe said, there, there's no secret sauce here. There's no classified anything. It's and, and these people, we need their intelligence. We need because you know, law enforcement, there's stuff that they're missing that the service providers during these briefings, they can say, oh, yeah, you might want to look for this or you know, there's there's information they have, law enforcement doesn't, and we're not getting it because, you know, traditionally we've kept our separate silos. We're law enforcement. We kick doors. We do this stuff. So it's it's really been uh, a, a really, it's, it's a, a great learning environment to, to watch as this develops and to see, you know, the relationships that are built there. And that's that's really a model I'm, I'm hoping that, that we can push out uh, everywhere, actually. Uh, I, I know that there's still some agencies that, unfortunately, I, I hear the complaints from service providers now that I'm interacting with them more, and they'll say, "Yeah, we, you know, this this agency uh, will go out do an operation, and they'll call me at two o'clock in the morning, you know, with no warning, and you know, so we we'll we'll show up, you know, but I, I got to get up, get dressed, and all this stuff, so it takes them a while to get there. That that doesn't help." You know, they we, we really need to educate law enforcement. And that's that's one of my jobs in the state of Oklahoma is to to go out, provide training and and really push this model that we're talking about here. This necessity, there's there's I mean, it's an absolute necessity that, that they work together because it's just not going to work otherwise. Well, I think, I think, you know, that makes a lot of sense, right? We've got to make sure that everyone's on the same page. They're working together. They're able to get those survivors to the relevant support services. And those it, it's respect for those organizations too, right? Like you talked about to know how do we, how do we interact with them the right way, but also, you know, letting law enforcement know there are resources to help them be more effective in their jobs, right? Uh, you've got skull games, uh, that are, you know, helping them with Intel and, and getting Intel packets together and things. And then you've got, you know, Austin, the work that you all are doing at Traverse. And in particular, one of the things that has been um, sort of this, uh, this unknown, right, this black hole within the human trafficking space is being able to effectively map networks, to understand really the scope, right? Where is trafficking happening? How does it look, et cetera? And I know Traverse Project has the Trace team, which has been doing some really incredible work in that space. Could you talk a little bit about what you're doing and kind of mapping out those networks and how that information is supporting the law enforcement interdiction efforts? Absolutely. So let me just back up for, for a minute. Um, for 10 plus years, all of us, law enforcement, nonprofits in the space, we've all been telling the public this is a $150 billion a year industry, right? And and Doug uh, kind of posted some numbers a few months ago that kind of shed some new light on that. You know, the NASDAQ estimated that uh, $346.7 billion of illicit uh, cash flow was due, it, it due to human trafficking globally, right? So 
I think what that kind of points out is what we've been doing just doesn't work. Um, you know, it, the International Labor um, Organization in um, in the UK, $173 billion last year just towards sex trafficking, right? So that's more than what we thought the entire industry was. Um, you know, we've, we've gone through iterations of law enforcement um, arresting prostitutes and call that human trafficking arrests, right? It does nothing. Right. Um, you know, and, and probably myself, Doug uh, and uh, and Joe and, and probably Kevin have all been on those arrest teams. Right. Arresting prostitutes at some point. Um, so what, when when I left my previous organization, we had a, in 2022, we had a, a very large operation about nine months long in the Dominican Republic where uh, Kevin's former organization, the one that he started, was a part of it. And he was one of our partners there uh, for this operation. But we had. We took three brothels, turned them into 14 targets, um, 14 target locations that the Dominican police raided. And um, and and then we kind of tracked that all the way down to Colombia. And then we kind of stopped. Right. And it wasn't Kevin's fault. It wasn't my fault. You know, uh, it was just kind of the way that industry is. And so we've we've kind of gotten to the arresting some brothel uh, traffickers and arresting or, and, and re recovering some victims, and then we just kind of call it a day, post our Instagram videos, and and get you know move on to the next one. And so I just got really frustrated at this, and it's it's a frustration that you know everybody on this panel has has uh, dealt with at some point. Of what are we doing? We're just we're mowing the grass, right? You know, every single week we're going out there and mowing the grass. And it grows back. Um, and so when I started Traverse Project, it was with the intention of kind of going to that next level, past the rescue, past the, the, the arrest, and kind of starting to track who is doing what in this space, right? On the bad guy, in the bad guy side. Um, and kind of mapping out those networks. And we know, you know, that. We're seeing drug cartels, we're seeing terror organizations getting involved with this on a global level, right? Um, you know, we're seeing drug cartels getting involved with human trafficking here in the United States. Um, so we wanted to start pushing towards that. So we use data-driven methods uh, to kind of figure out who these folks are that are, um, uh, you know, associated and then just kind of doing pattern of life investigations and building those further and further out. It's the 100,000 mile view. Yeah, no, it's amazing, but it's necessary work, right? Because, you know, recent, when you talk about resource limitation, law enforcement's resource limited, right? You, you talked earlier Absolutely. about the limitations of tribal law enforcement, but even, you know, at the local state, to some extent, the federal level, there are limitations there as well, right? And this is not uh, the only issue that law enforcement's looking to, to address. Um, so having organizations like Traverse, Skull Games, ATII, being able to come alongside and support and augment that work is critical if we're going to have success in truly eradicating human trafficking. All right. So, gentlemen, we're running out of time. So uh, what I'm going to ask you to do to kind of round this out is your your 30 second elevator pitch. You are standing in front of a multidisciplinary group. You've got law enforcement in the room. You've got uh, survivor services. You've got other government agencies. And in 30 seconds, from your experience, your background, your perspective, you make the pitch to them as to why they should be involved in a multidisciplinary team or a, as Doug pointed out, because you know, every federal agency likes to have their own acronyms, right? An ECM task force, whatever you want to call it, right? Why should you work together? Uh, and uh, Kevin, I'm going to start with you. Oh, thanks. So, <laughs> uh, that su super difficult question. It kind of you know depends on on the the mindset. So where I'm at now, it, I mean, it's, it's already sold. But uh, as, as I'm going out, we, we got to look at results. We got to look at the places that are doing this and. We, we have a lot of these examples out here, uh, Mississippi. I'm aware of Tulsa, not, not aware of any of the others in Oklahoma just yet. But what I'm seeing are the, the results. You just cannot get that any other way. We, we cannot do this alone. Human trafficking is much different than drug arrests, much different than homicides, much different than DWIs. It's, it is a, an incredibly complex uh, mix, and it, it's going to take all of us working together and and if 
you're not seeing that yet, then you you really don't understand the problem. Thank you, Austin. So I, I think when you look at um, agencies around the country, um, there's not one that I could point to that could handle the entire thing on its own, right? And um, you know, when we started this uh, this native project that we're we're pushing out just uh, in the next month or so, um, it we looked at where we could be successful with partners, where we'd find partners that would want to work together. And Oklahoma is one of those, right? You know, um, we've got the AG's office. Uh, we've got uh, two two uh, native law enforcement agencies uh, and a bunch of nonprofits that were in a meeting last week. And everybody wants to participate in this. And so that's what we looked at because Kevin's absolutely right. We have to start showing that this works better than that. Right. And the only way we're going to do that is by getting partners together at the table, state, federal, local, nonprofit, for profit. And that's what this entire program that we built out for this native program is about. We've got universities, we've got uh, uh, for profit organizations, nonprofits. You know, hopefully the federal government's coming in uh, very soon. We've got state level law enforcement, local, tribal. And that's, we will, you will see really great results come out of this concept rather than just the do it on your own kind of concept we've seen for a long time siloed approach you're muted thank you sir joe what do you tell this group oh kind of to echo kevin uh he did say results uh my only caveat would be credible results um, just because it's a big organization, like some of the biggest ones in the country, doesn't mean they're doing credible work. Um, that goes for the NGO world and for the law enforcement world. Um, I would say if you're seeing big sting operations, that those are the first ones I question because those become numbers game. And when they become a numbers game, the people that were claiming to help the most are the ones that pay the biggest uh, when it comes to being criminalized. Um, always leave politics out of it work with agencies that are not out playing the political game because that will be very, very difficult and it muddies the water. And understand that no single law enforcement agency, no nor single anti-trafficking organization has the secret sauce to anything. Um, we have to add all of the ingredients that each one can bring to the table and make that sauce that way. So just understand that we're all our little own ingredients we're not gonna we're gonna not gonna make the sauce until it's all put together. I love Perfect. it. I like I like it spicy. So yeah. And quality over quantity, so so important. Uh Doug. Yeah, so two quick points. One, when law enforcement and service providers work together, that's often the first opportunity for a victim in that situation to see what a healthy functional relationship looks like. They, the, the people that we deal with, the, the victims that we encounter, they've never known a healthy functional relationship. Many of them, they grew up in dysfunctional homes, dysfunctional families, um, you know, un, unstable housing um, and, and people have been exploiting them. You know, the, the worst kind of dysfunction there is. And so when they can sit down at a table across from a law enforcement officer and a victim service provider and see them working together for their benefit, that's huge. Um, the second thing I would say, as far as a reason to get involved in working collaboratively is because survivors say it works. Um, over the last year, I've had an opportunity to kind of go back and redo some research, um, but bring survivors into the mix. And they all say, this is what works. They weren't helped out of their situation because of the way that we used to do things. They didn't get out of their situations until we learned to work together. Perfect. Gentlemen, I just want to thank you for your time sharing your insights. Uh, Doug Gilmore with Resolve Strategies, formerly with DHS. Uh, we're so thankful that you're now out in the private sector so that people can 
really tap into that brain of yours and get you involved in uh, in some of these these projects. Uh, Kevin Metcalf, congratulations with your new role at the attorney, uh, the Oklahoma Attorney General's Office. We know that you're going to be putting together uh, a fantastic statewide strategy. We're here to help and support uh, Austin with with all the work that Traverse is doing and supporting law enforcement, mapping those networks, getting into those issues uh, that other organizations aren't touching, like MMIP, uh, is is really really incredible. Thank you. And Joe, of course, uh, you have been uh, a rock in this space. You've been, uh, you know, leading the charge out in front, not from behind, uh, for many, many years now, and always appreciate your insights. Um, thank you all for joining this this really incredible and necessary conversation and being a part of ATII's uh, conference. We encourage you to go to the website, www.followmoneyfightslavery.org, to see some of the resources that ATI has to offer uh, for law enforcement, but also for the private sector, for financial institutions and others that are working in that space, um, as our niche is really helping dismantle the financial component, right, the, the illicit funds that are being moved throughout this. So again, thank you everybody for joining. Uh, and we are here to support you.